Um, hello, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Tom Banks, editor of uh, Design Week magazine, and I'm joined by um, former DNOD chief executive Patrick Goyne, who's um, head judge or president of um, the magazine and newspaper design category for uh, this year's DNOD awards. Um, yeah, well, so I, I think today we're, we're giving everyone some, some insight into the physical judging that you've been been doing, which took place for the uh, the magazine and newspaper design category. I'm really glad that we got to judge it uh, in person, actually. I mean, he just, I think it would have been pretty impossible to judge newspapers and magazines just looking at screenshots. Um, you know, you've got to pick these things up, flick through them, feel them, touch them to really get a sense of, of what a great magazine or newspaper is about. So um, it was great that we were able to do it in person. Um, and I'd say it was a really, really good jury as well. The mix of people and the different ex levels of ex experience they had. Um, we had really, really good uh, discussions. So yeah, it was actually a really enjoyable day. Slightly weird with all the kind of COVID protocols and so on, um, right. but uh, we coped. And um, yeah, it was it was a it was a great day actually. Well, yeah, no, I'm mean, excited to get into this because this is magazines and, and newspapers are obviously pretty close to, to what I do as well. Um, so what uh, what makes an exceptional entry in, in magazine and newspaper design? What were the um, what were the things that, that really stood out? Well, I think I mean it's kind of interesting challenge uh, judging magazines and newspapers in the context of something like DNAD because um, creative awards tend to ask for a level of originality and almost sort of de demand some kind of uh, novelty perhaps. And of course, one of the things about magazines and uh, in particular is they have to deliver with a level of consistency you know you want a great a great magazine design needs to be a robust system that you can repeat and then of course mm -hmm. yes you can play with that and take it in different directions and so on but but it needs to have that consistency it needs to deliver on people's expectations each time with a kind of element of surprise so you have you always have those the, the mixture of those two things and i think you know that was kind of interesting discussion that we had at the beginning of, of judging where there were some titles which have consistently done well at dnad and at other award shows and you know how would we deal with those how would we deal with things which were the kind of usual suspects but nevertheless were still excellent um and i think we you know we we um reached a conclusion that we shouldn't penalise people for being consistently excellent because in magazines and newspapers in particular, that is what you need to do. You need to be able to deliver that weekly, monthly, whatever the, the, um, the frequency of your title is. So we shouldn't um, you know, disallow something just because it's been good over a, over a period of time. Um, we should just evaluate it on what we see in front of us. But it, yeah, it does make it slightly difficult, I think, um judging magazines in particular um in that kind of context of of awards where some of the criteria specifically ask for um originality um, and when you all managed to to get together what, what kind of things stood out this year well there were a number of things i mean i think um in particular um there were um the new york times is is one of those which year in year out for probably the last what at least five years maybe even a decade now has delivered consistently the new york times magazine but also the newspaper the special supplements that they do the kids supplement in particular has been consistently brilliant um, and it's a great example of a publication that um, thoroughly believes in the power of design um, at every level. So you can see from what they do that it's not just that they've got a great design department, not just that they've got great photo editors and photo commissioners, it's also that the editorial team from the editors down believe in what design can do and are really kind of working as a, a team to deliver excellence consistently. Um, and, and yeah, people might say, oh, well, it's all very well for them having the resources that they've got, but you know, there are plenty of other. Uh, newspapers and magazines around the world that have similar resources but don't do the same job so it's not just about having great resources available um, and I think in particular with you know magazine newspapers at the moment there's such pressure on costs uh, and such pressure on I would imagine design departments to justify 
every bit of spend that it's still fantastic to see um, them being super ambitious, having brilliant photo stories, brilliant illustration commissions and brilliant kind of themed issues. So, so that was a, a great one. Um, another kind of real highlight, and again, it's something that I think has, has won before at DNAD, is Buffalo Zine, which um, if people don't know, it's a really fun um, fashion magazine, um, quite satirical, always kind of having a, a, an interesting standpoint on, on playing around with um, the fashion industry and, um, and sending it up somewhat. Um, but also doing stuff at a very, very high level in terms of its commissioning and the people, the photographers they work with, the stylists they work with, and really kind of playful ideas around each issue and the concept for each issue. Um, so that was another real highlight. Um, and then across the piece, there were some other really nice things. Um, one in particular stood out for me, um, kind of at the other end of the scale, really, was a newsprint publication for the local council in Murcia in, in Spain. Uh, and it's called Dinamo. And it basically it's like a newsletter for kind of stuff going on for young people in Murcia. Um, and it's done by um, a local uh, design studio, Rubio and Del Amo, who I didn't know about before actually. Um, but a fantastic kind of use of type, fantastic use of illustration a really kind of fun, lively, beautifully designed um, thing that in other hands could have been a very kind of dull workaday um, you know, newsletter, um, but really, really ambitious, really beautifully done. And a great example, sort of the other end of the scale from something like the New York Times, where yeah. I would imagine, you know, pretty limited resources, limited budget, probably not the easiest as client. I don't know the people in the council at Murcia, but I, you know, local councils are generally not the easiest to work with in a kind of creative way. Um, so that was a real kind of uh, highlight for me, actually, to see something like that. It was, it was great. It was a really, really beautifully put together publication. So were you consciously trying to um, sort of give some equity to some sort of smaller things or, you know, people with bigger teams, people with smaller teams? Was that, no, was that one of the considerations? When you're, when you're judging stuff like this, you're always aware of that. You're always aware of, uh, oh, here's somebody who's probably, who's done an outstanding job on limited resources, or here's somebody who's done something different in what could be a relatively kind of unpromising or dry subject area. Here's somebody who's taken... Um, you know, something which was not the easiest to get excited about and done something fresh with it. I think, you know, you're always looking to reward that, I think, uh, and bear that mm -hmm. in mind, um, as well as, I think, not be not shying away from the stuff that's truly spectacular, even if you, you know that there's a big team behind it and big resources and so on. So, you know, you want both. And uh, it was great yeah. to see that we did have both um, in terms of the work that we, we, we were asked to judge. Um, so was, I'd say, and I know, I mean, this has been a category which I think Jeremy Leslie's done a huge amount over the years to try and encourage and try and grow. Um, it is difficult, I think, um, particularly for uh, independents probably to find um, money to enter something like this. Uh, it's probably difficult mm -hmm. actually for the mainstream newspapers as well to find some budget to spend on something like this. So it would have been nicer to see... Uh, I guess a wider variety from the indie magazine section. We didn't see as much um, stuff as I think the jurors would have liked to have seen. And on the other side, we saw relatively few um, complete newspapers. There are quite a few supplements or special editions, but relatively few complete newspapers. And I imagine that's probably just reflective of that market and, and what's going on there at the moment. I can't imagine there's huge amounts of investment in new print design right now across the world. Um, yeah, I was, I was wondering if you could uh, tell us sort of why a, a DNAD pencil is important and, and what it actually means to, to win one. I think it's quite interesting from this category's perspective uh, in terms of, um, you know, the value of winning at DNAD. Um, I think what's been really interesting um, over this category development, and, I, and I, again, should pay tribute to Jeremy Leslie, who's done so much work in 
in uh, developing this category and kind of um, convincing people of the value of winning a DNAD, whether they are just um, a group of people who put together their own indie, indie magazine, um, you know, under their own team, um, all the way through to um, big newspaper titles. Obviously, their reasons for wanting to win and the value of winning will vary, but it's great to see both investing in um, entering DNAD. And I think for, um, for the um, smaller titles, the indie titles, I think having the validation of their peers who uh, you know, have a kind of breadth of knowledge about this area um, and the, that sort of support from, from their peers um, which I get from winning a DNAD award is, 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 is fantastic for them and I'm sure gives them a huge kind of boost to, to be recognized in this way. I think at the more kind of uh, commercial level, um, I think, uh, Tom, you and I both know that, you know, big publishing groups actually do place a premium on, on winning awards. Um, they like to win, win awards for uh, content and for their editorial, and um, it is meaningful for them. And I think where you've got a situation within larger publishing groups where there's such a, a lot of pressure on costs, I think it's probably very helpful um, for a design team to win at DNAD to be able to say to the rest of the company, look, we are the best in our field. This is the, the award that means the most in our world uh, and we've won it. And that will really help, I think, um, probably convince some of the people that hold the purse strings um, to uh, keep investing in quality design, quality, quality editorial. Right. <laughs> and and, and look, looking at the standard um, across the whole category, um, what, what was it like? Did these, um, the, the ones that you focused on then, did they, they've obviously stood out, but what was the, the competition like? I think, I mean, it's, you know, there's always a mixture. I think um, there were some interesting um, attempts to play with format, so that's always quite nice. There were some mm. interesting... Um, couple of titles that were trying to take on issues around sustainability and do that in a way that maybe had a sort of slightly fresh visual language around it. I think that's a big challenge at the moment to how to tell those stories, how to engage people with issues around sustainability, to do it in a way that is um, engaging for people and doesn't fall into the sort of cliche of that, of that world. Um, so I think that, you know, there were some things that did that really well. Something that we were quite conscious of um, as a group uh, was the use of materials um, by the by titles. So we, we, you know, we're very kind of conscious that designers have a responsibility here when uh, it comes to choosing um, the materials and print finishes and, and so on, um, and really looking for where somebody maybe had used, I don't know, um, a varnish or a print or a finish or uh, a slipcase or something that was maybe plastic or might have rendered the um, the paper unrecyclable, was it justified? Mm -hmm. Can it ever be justified now? Had they thought about that um, and trying to shy away from kind of gratuitous use of overproduction, I guess? Um, right. I mean, there's a couple of titles that did it quite nicely in terms of playing with formats. Um, I don't know if you know um, the rubbish fanzine, um, which came in a, comes in a box, uh, and then within that box, there's um, the main um, magazine itself. It has multiple different uh, paper sizes all bound together, um, it did, which it did really well. I think personally, I'm always kind of wary of those sorts of things that are really almost overproduced or can be overproduced. I don't like um, magazines that you have to fight with as a reader to um, get through, you know, so you're kind of bending stuff back here or holding it out here. I like to, you know, right. I don't want to wrestle with the magazine. I want to be able to sit down and read it easily. Um, maybe that's just me as an editor. Um, and I think there's, there are a couple that I think were sort of overdone in that respect and, and, and they just weren't easy to handle and you just kind of, oh, I can't be bothered with this thing. So I think that, I think sometimes okay. designers get a bit too kind of carried away with having lots of different paper stocks and different sizes, and it looks good, but once you actually get to grips with it, it's really difficult. Um, and was there anything that came up a lot in terms of uh, trends or, or themes or anything that you kind of kept noticing? 
Um, I don't think this year that there was a, a particular theme or trend. I think there have been some sort of fairly well-established uh, trends, particularly in the indie magazine world, over quite some time, and obviously they still came through. So, you know, the, the, um, it's a, you, nearly always uncoated stock. There's nearly always a sort of muted colour palette. Um, the illustration mm -hmm. styles. Um, are there a couple of titles that I felt fell a little bit into that kind of um, quite uh, familiar indie magazine visual language. So I think it was nice to see some other stuff that broke out of that. I mean, Buffalo in particular just breaks out of, of all of that. Um, you know, the, the, it, it, it sort of gleefully plays around with form and format and, um, and was just, you know, you could just feel they entered several issues and, um, you know, it just felt like here's a team that's having a huge amount of fun, really knows it's kind of industry inside out, which enables them to play with stuff while at the same time maintaining that kind of interest and quality. Um, so it's not just um, kind of, uh, it's, it still stands up, like the shoots that they do still stand up, the issues they still stand up. But mm -hmm. um, you could just feel the kind of, um, energy and fun kind of coming off the pages um if 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 we're talking about more sort of topical things i guess one was um some titles dealing with sustainability um mm -hmm. but also i guess the big one was um the new york times 1619 project which actually happened uh was published last year uh august 16 9, august um 2019 so um, it, it predates all the Black Lives Matters protests, but certainly right. you could see a kind of line from what they were talking about uh, and the um, social and cultural and political kind of um, landscape that that issue went out into, um, made that feel very kind of prescient and, and um, it was just a superb project. I mean, it's just a fantastic project. Okay. Well, what if we get to the, the judging itself um, uh, now? Um, judging can often be sort of tense at, at, at times. I wonder if there was any kind of uh, any butting of heads or any good debates. I think there was some very good um, kind of honest um, questioning of uh, certain things. You know, there, there's always a danger in some judging where stuff almost gets kind of nodded through because, oh, well, it's that, you know, and everyone likes that, don't they? And it's one, one elsewhere and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think all the judges were very good at um, kind of dealing with that and, and saying, you know, hold, hang on a minute, are we absolutely sure? Actually, is this very good? Is this the best thing that they've done? Um, what have they done? Something similar to this before, um, you, you know, really kind of um, questioning um, everything. Um, and bringing in some interesting kind of context. And uh, you know, that's what I mean about it being a really good jury because jury members were able to kind of bring in some of their outside knowledge and say, well, actually, you know, this is why this was good or did you know about this? And, and so it was, um, that was really helpful as well, I think. Well, one of the other debates that we had at the start, which was really interesting, was about um, magazines or newspapers that have a political standpoint that we might not necessarily agree with. So again, that was just kind of, um, being mindful of the fact that um, a magazine or a, or a newspaper is created for a particular audience. And if we are not part of that audience and we're not necessarily in line with, with that audience or, or what it believes in, just being uh, able to set that aside and judge the uh, design of those news newspapers or, or magazines in terms of their appropriate for that audience. I mean, there were kind of relative yeah. few titles that that was an issue around but it was good to have that debate at the start actually i think we kind of had that before we'd even sort of seen what was what was laid out it was that was something actually that um one of the judges kuchaswara um brought up um and that was again you know a really good point to kind of clarify before we got to grips with everything uh i suppose creative people tend to come from um a similar place um politically and culturally um, mm. and certainly with magazines and newspapers, they don't all come from that place. There's a very broad spectrum of views and, you know, long, long may that continue. 
Um, and, uh, you know, you have to be very, very mindful, as I say, of the audience that this particular title is, is created for. And it might not be to your taste, but if it's to their taste and you can see that it's done very, very well, then that shouldn't prevent something from being awarded. And um, so uh, was, was there much kind of general consensus with, with any of the winners or was that again still, uh, were there still big talking points there? With the two yellow pencils, uh, which were um, the Buffalo Zine issue number nine, copyright issue, and the New York Times 1619 project, I think um, they were, you know, it's pretty unanimous, those two. I think with Buffalo, there were, um, I think, three issues um, entered. The food issue, which I think um, is called Fashion's Kitchen, which was issue number eight, was also fantastic, I have to say. It's, it was, it's the sort of book-sized um, fashion meets food um, issue, and it was done absolutely brilliantly. I mean, all the shoots, all the commissioning was, was fantastic. Again, really playful, really funny in parts. It was great. But I think the um, I think we were all felt that the copyright issue, which it was an issue all about um, copying in fashion and, and, ref and the use of reference in fashion. Um, lots of really great content inside. Um, but the thing that was really, really exciting was what they'd done with the covers, which is basically they produced multiple covers, each of which was a kind of pastiche of another well-known fashion magazine. So there was one that was like ID, there was one that was like 032C, and it was, and it was just really, really clever. And they'd done it so well, like the, the photography um, it was just perfect. Um, and it was really funny. Uh, it was very appropriate for the issue. And they put this sort of massive copyright Buffalo Zine thing on the front. Um, it was brilliant. It was so <laughs> playful and funny, but also worked um, in the context of that issue being all about um, copying and reference. So that was that was great. Um, the 1619 project. I think we we all felt that it was um, hugely ambitious. So 16, basically it's called 1619 because August 1619 was the date when the first ship carrying African slaves landed on the American continent, it was in, in Virginia. And the sort of provocation of this project was to suggest that August 1619 should be seen as the true founding date of America and uh, everything, uh, the, the economic, societal, cultural, political history of America, uh, you cannot divorce from slavery and uh, what happened during slavery and continues to happen today. Um, and so it was a kind of hugely risky thing to do. And I know that New York Times has had an enormous amount of criticism for it. Um, and it was, you know, very, very, as I say, very a, a big risk thing to do. But in from design terms, editorial terms, it was superbly executed. There was a there was a magazine, there was a sub mm -hmm. a newspaper. I think the kind of clincher as well was that there was also um, it took it further than that into online components as well. So there was one of the spectacular um, uh, all singing, all dancing New York Times websites for the project, which has become, you know, New York Times has become really well known for. In addition to that, was a whole audio series. And in addition to that, they'd worked with Pulitzer on developing um, a school's curriculum around all the subject matter. Um, so it's just kind of an all round amazing editorial project, brilliantly delivered by, by the design teams and the, and the editorial teams. Well, I suppose with, with both of these projects, the thing they have in common is some kind of risk taking and also the yeah. conviction to, to see those ideas right through. Absolutely. Like I mean, yeah, I, I agree entirely. You know, they're both risky, um, but they were both really carried through. And in a, you know, obviously, a very contrasting way. On the one hand, you've got something which is very fun, very funny, mm -hmm. very playful. And then the other hand, something which is you know incredibly serious and incredibly important, incredibly provocative. Um, so it was nice to have actually those two very contrasting things as our, as our winners. I think, you know, you need to have a level of 
ambition, a level of originality and, and, and risk. You need to see something really kind of pushed and to be able to sense that here was a team kind of working almost kind of at its limits to really go that extra mile and deliver something really special. I think that's what makes a, a yellow pencil winner. So um, how, how can this category sort of keep evolving and, and moving forward? Well, I think something which um, is probably worth considering, I mentioned with the 1619 project how important it was to see the online element to that and um, to, to know that there were these other um, parts to it. And at the moment, I think um, this category is about print. I think it would be interesting to have this jury who are um, newspaper and magazine specialists and who would be working these days, you know, you have to you have to work across all the manifestations of a, of a magazine brand or newspaper brand as a designer, as a creative director. Um, you will have a say in how that magazine or newspaper brand expresses itself across everything. So I think it would be interesting to, to allow um, websites, uh, apps, other you know digital manifestations of newspaper and magazine brands whether alongside the print as in the case of 1619 so that was kind of already happening or whether mm -hmm. to have uh, you know newspaper websites magazine websites uh, magazine apps as, as part of this i'm not sure if that's uh, been the case in previous years it might well have been um but yeah it would have been it felt sort of slightly weird now that you know as you know um magazine brands in particular, and I mean, newspaper brands, um, exist across platforms um, to just look at the print from the perspective of a jury that was highly specialised in magazine and newspapers. Um, mm. Felt slightly weird. I mean, you could even bring in social media. I mean, we both know how important social media is to support um, newspapers and magazines and the best ones see those channels as, as a publishing platform in their own right um, and do really exciting things with them. Um, I mean, you, you, so yeah, you could judge those things in the digital categories, but I think it would be interesting um, to have the specialised knowledge of, a, of this jury look at how magazines and newspapers manifest themselves in all the across all the different platforms now that they, that they operate under. Yeah, definitely, because they, they don't think about the individual uh, outputs they might as you say operate in in all of those areas so yeah. it would be interesting to see that kind of thing and um, i wondered if sort of looking to young graphic designers or, or art directors maybe um like specialists in, in data viz or information design um what would be your advice for anyone wanting to to get into newspaper and magazine design or any of those those other areas that you just mentioned then as well well i, I mean i um the cynic in me would say, be careful because, uh, as we both know, it's, it's particularly like, you know, magazines, newspapers are going through a really tough time at the moment. However, uh, and maybe, you know, in spite of the kind of restrictions, we have seen this fantastic kind of creative renaissance, particularly in magazines. I mean, um, you know, you go to Jeremy's Mag Culture site or go into his shop. Um, you know, the array of fantastic magazines, really interesting magazines that people are doing for the love of it. You know, we never had so many exciting independent um, magazine titles as, as we have right now. So as a field for creativity and expression, magazines probably stronger than they ever were. So, um, and, and there's still something absolutely wonderful about particularly a mag making a magazine. Uh, finding something that you love or are really excited about, are really interested in, and um, using the magazine as the way to bring that together, I think is 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 as kind of thrilling and uh, fulfilling as as it's ever been. And it's great that to see so many people doing it for the love of it. So, you know, any young people out there um, should certainly um, you know investigate and not shy away from. Um, using the magazine as a way to you know, express themselves or, 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 or investigate things that they're excited by or interested in. And, and it, still, it still works. It's still uh, a beautiful kind of format and medium to uh, talk about the world around us. 
Lovely. All right. Well, yeah, it sounds like there's lots lots to uh, explore. So, um, I'm, yeah, looking forward to having a proper look at this category. But, yeah, it's been good talking to you. Um, and, um, yeah, thanks for uh, running us through it. No problem.